Here we go, 18. 19, 20, I don't know. Yeast must not be found in your houses for seven days. If anyone eats something leavened, that person, whether a foreign resident or native of the land, must be cut off from the community of Israel. Do not eat anything leavened. Eat unleavened bread in all your homes. Okay, that kind of tells you, it answers your question. It kind of tells you that they probably should know better. You know what I'm saying? They probably should, if they have any doubt, to throw it away. You know? Anyway, I, it, it doesn't specifically say they did it unintentionally, but still. You want to, this is something they obviously, it would be like us saying, uh, you, well, drive down B Ridge and you don't know the speed limit's 45 because the sign is over there and you pulled on here and you go 50, you're still guilty. Right? So I don't know. I don't know how they'd handle that, but by, my guess is that they wouldn't really tolerate. They'd say you should know. You know, I didn't mean to kill my brother. We should have known not to do that, right? So. You can say the difference. Oh, yeah. Bread oh, I, I, that's what I think. I think it's, but you know what? I went to, because I didn't know you could buy matzah bread when I went around the country, and I didn't want, I wanted to take something that wasn't leavened. And so I went to uh, Walmart to buy some unleavened bread, and I looked at every single, Ritz crackers look unleavened. They're not. Um, you get all these different things, and the only thing I could find without yeast in it was the uh, water, water crackers. They're called water crackers. They didn't have any yeast, so I took those with me. But, um, I, you know, now I know you can buy matzo bread in any store as long as, I mean, you can buy it any store. But I didn't know that at the time. So, okay, here we go. We're in, uh, we're, uh, we're in Joshua chapter 14, Diane. Yeah. <laughs> all right, go ahead. We're in there. Uh... Exodus 12, 21. 21. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go, select an animal from the flock according to your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a cluster of hyssop. 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 Okay, hyssop is like a mint. It's a type of plant. It's a minty type of plant. You can use it for spices. And before we go on, before we go on, let's turn to the 54, 51st Psalm, okay, and it says here, where are we going to go to? Yes, this is King David after he has been um, found out, okay, we're going to, I'm going to start with verse 1. When you get there, just get to the 51st Psalm, it says, I'll read the opening while you're looking for it, to the chief musician. A psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he'd gone into Bathsheba. He's been found guilty of having committed adultery and killing Bathsheba's wife Uriah. And David in his, he, he could have had the prophet killed. He could have said, I'm the king, big deal. And instead, in typical form of David, he understands the absolute depravity of his own heart. And he writes the most moving psalm in the entire Psalter. He writes this, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned. He acknowledges right there that we don't sin against other people. When we murder somebody, we don't sin against that person. We sin against God. We violate another person, but we don't sin against them. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak. And Paul, I believe, quotes that in the New Testament. And blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, your desire, you desire truth in the inward parts and the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. There you go. He's going back to the symbolism of ancient Israel and we're going to see hyssop used all throughout Leviticus and elsewhere when Moses uh, confirms the law. He takes the hyssop and he dips it in blood and water and cedar and uh, scarlet wool. They make a mixture of it. He dips it in there and he sprinkles everything with it. He sprinkles the tabernacle. He sprinkles the people. He sprinkles the law because without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins and everything must be purified with blood according to Hebrews chapter 9. 
everything must be purged with blood. Okay? And so he goes on. He says, wash me and I shall be whiter and snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken. We're just going to read the whole thing because it's so beautiful. Um, that you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. He never says, restore to me my salvation. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. That God, the God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you desire, do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of the righteousness. With burnt offering and whole burnt offering, then they shall offer bulls on your altar. So there you go. King David, what a man after God. And he goes right back to this symbolism here and he says, purge me with hyssop. Okay? It takes blood. It takes death to clean me. Do it, please. Okay? And that's where this comes from. This first time this is mentioned. Go ahead. Wait, wait, wait. Yes. I got something cool. Okay. It says here that the hyssop plants right. that they used, okay, it, it had white flowers, it had a hairy surface, and it, it, it held liquids well, okay? Right. Listen to this. In John 19, 29, a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, yes. put a sponge on a stalk of the hyssop, hyssop. plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. That's right. The same thing in the New Testament. You see the parallels. I'm glad you brought that up because it went over my head, but that's exactly right. Is that the hyssop was used, placed at Jesus' lips in exactly the same fashion as mentioned here. And if you go to 2 Peter, uh, 1 Peter, at the very beginning of his uh, first letter, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The sprinkling is the hyssop. It's taking it and sprinkling. It's not just pouring it out. It's taking and it's being sprinkled. And that's where it comes from is the hyssop being dipped into the blood. And he's saying that this is what Christ does for us. He sprinkles us with his blood and it cleanses the whole of humanity. If they'll just simply call on him. Okay, all that symbolism is right there right there in the Bible, and it just permeates it. Throughout the Bible, you'll see this. Go ahead. Take a cluster of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and brush the lentil and the two doorposts with some of the blood in the basin. None of you may go out the door of his house until morning, when the Lord passes through to strike Egypt and sees the blood on the lentil and the two doorposts. He will pass over the door and not let the destroyer enter your houses to strike you. Mm. Story. The angel of death. Ooh. Yeah. Keep this command permanently as a statute for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, you are to observe this ritual. And so this is to continue on. This isn't something that is just while they're heading to Israel. They're to do this forever. Do you remember, did you see the Ten Commandments? Uh, when th this night happened in the Ten Commandments and that mist is going through the land and it's spooky, you know? I mean, but we don't know what it looked like in the Bible, but the destroyer or the angel of death goes through and he just, you know, he does his job. If he doesn't see the blood, you're fair game. That's it. All right. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, you have observed this ritual. Okay, before we go on, this comes to mind. What is it that saved the people inside the house? Their obedience and their trust and their faith. That's exactly right. I'm glad nobody said the blood. Right? Mm. It's not the blood itself. It is the faith in the blood. You walk outside, you know, you can say, oh yeah, this will work, and you could paint some red paint on there, right? Yeah. It's the faith that's involved. It's the faith. And so even in the Old Testament, the faith is what saves a person. Do we actually have Jesus' blood sprinkled all over us? No. We have 
His blood that was shed 2,000 years ago that we are putting our faith in. The Old Testament and the New, it is always by faith. I talked about this just a little last night, but what is the day that's coming up this week, 7 October? It's the day of atonement, what? atonement. Yom Kippur, okay? They are told to observe the law of Moses, right? Okay? If you do these things, you shall live by them, is what Moses said. What does the Day of Atonement in, uh, imply? What? The, it's no? Isn't it? Yeah, but what does it imply? Moses says if you do these things, you'll live by them. What does it imply if you have a Day of Atonement? Obedience. You haven't been doing them. You haven't been doing them. You can't do them. The whole point of the Day of Atonement is that we can't observe the law, and so it goes right back to faith. It goes right back to faith. And when people say, oh, the Old Testament is faith plus works, I'm sorry. Absolutely not. It always goes back to faith because you wouldn't have a Day of Atonement if you did. And what does it say at the Day of Atonement? Go out and deny yourselves and fast and cry out to the Lord. The guy goes in and throws a bunch of blood on a piece of gold sitting on a, 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 an ark. That's going to do it? That's going to save me? It's the faith in what he is doing. It's the fact that you are saying, I know I didn't meet the requirements this year, and I am asking God in faith to forgive me. And what does it say? Paul says it in the New Testament. I'm going to quote this one too. I hate to give away the whole sermon, but this is all pertains to what we're talking about here. What does Paul say in the New Testament about salvation? In the book of Romans, he says, from faith to faith. Old Testament and New. He quotes the Old Testament, the just shall live by faith from the book of Habakkuk. And then he says, from faith to faith. That is what saves you. There is nothing else on the face of the earth that can save us. Not reading the Bible, not giving money to church, no other thing. And that's why when churches start getting into all of these things, well, we should say a rosary or we should stay in church all day on Saturday or whatever the denomination says you should do. You can't drink wine. You can't do this. You can't do that. I'm sorry, you have deviated from the very precept of the Bible. From faith to faith, the just shall, be, shall live by faith. And that's when Martin Luther came to his great epiphany. He was reading Romans 8, and he said, I've missed it all these years. He's, what was it? The guy, has you ever heard the story of Martin Luther? I took this out of the sermon because it was just too long, so I'll tell you this right now. The guy was a basket case. He was, he was so, yes, he, 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 he was so aware of his sin. He was so utterly aware of his sin that he'd get up all day long and all night long. He couldn't sleep. He'd go up and he'd say, he'd go and confess his sins to the guy down the hall, the, the priest or whatever the guy was, and he'd say, I just had an unclean thought. Oh, it, uh, you know, go do seven Hail Marys and go lay back down. And he did this continuously. He, he couldn't sleep. And he went to Rome and he'd climb up the stairs on his knees the way they're told, you know, climb up the, up the stairs on your knees and you've got to cut yourself and you've got to do this. And he was doing everything. He'd go and touch every icon that they had everywhere. And he'd pray to it. And he was, he was a basket case. He was a neurosis knowing that no matter what he did, he was no closer. He never got any closer to God. He was just... He was beside himself with the sin that he had in his life. And you know, sometimes it takes somebody that is on the verge of insanity to bring out reality. And this guy, he's, he's finally, after all of this struggling, I brought it up at the beginning of the class, somebody handed him the Bible and said, well, here, try this, maybe this will help. You know, a book that had dust all over it. And he got to Romans 8, and his whole life changed. I have been deceived. And you know, if we could just, your friend, I think about him all the time now. He, He's trying to work his way to heaven through through observing the Sabbath and maybe the feast days and this and that. You know, I, what's he going to do? Burn uh, exactly. What are you going to do? Go to Jerusalem every year? It says to do that. We've got a friend that we went to Israel with. I don't even talk to her anymore. I finally just defriended her from Facebook. She's like this. She's just she's. Oh. Oh, oh, everything is just, it's a catastrophe in the world. And there's a conspiracy under every rock. There's, the, the world is being led by the Freemasons and the Lumentarians. And I've got to go to Seventh-day Adventists. And I've got to, and I've got to go to this church and that church. And her whole life is, Christ freed her from all of that. Forget all of that stuff. It, but you know what? People would rather live in misery then have the freedom that comes from Christ. That's just, some people just want that. And then some people want the opposite, but they're never given the opportunity because the people in the church, and that's what Jude talks about, the book of Jude, how these people creep in, 
They in, uh, bring in destructive heresies and everybody suffers because of that. So the people that want freedom never get free. Jesus mentioned them as well and uh, uh, he said, um, woe to you scribes and Pharisees because you lay burdens on people and yet you won't lay a finger, lift a finger to help them. And so the people have these burdens and it's the leader's fault, but they have no way of getting out of it because they're stuck under these people. 